Thank you, Dr. Baker, and thank all of you for being here today. On behalf of the City of Phoenix, we are so proud to be part of this celebration and to take this time to say thank you for all that the city community does for Phoenix and for Arizona. We have had wonderful partnerships, whether it's you supported our employees at the airport when the federal government had shut down and TSA workers still say thank you to partnering with us to plant trees and other ways to make a more beautiful community. I joined Dr. Baker in being grateful to the community for making sure that we have a world-class art museum in our community and a nationwide leading space at this museum that would be wonderful to be back in that space. As a mayor, it is certainly an honor to welcome a visiting mayor and looking forward to, to hearing from you. We are so pleased to have you in Phoenix and I know how much it meant to our community here in Phoenix when you won your election, so thank you for being with us here today. One of the great duties of the mayor of Phoenix is that you can proclaim community-wide events of importance and celebration. And so today I have with me a proclamation asking all residents of the city of Phoenix to recognize this 550th anniversary of the birth of Guru Nanak. And so uh, if you could join me and if a few members of the community would be willing to come down and I would ask uh, both our current mayor and our former mayor, Greg Stanton, if you could also come up and join me in presenting this proclamation. Thank you. The mayor had a great proclamation. It is my honor uh, to celebrate this uh, this amazing uh, day, this 550 uh, birthday of the, uh, the new garage. I also have a proclamation, uh, a couple of them. Uh, first, I'd like to present one to the Phoenix Art Museum itself in honor of furthering the value of religious diversity through promoting art and cultural programming that reflects the rich history and contributions of Sikhism. So I'll okay. that to our uh, interim executive director. And then I'd like to present one to the Sikh community of Greater Peace. Mayor Guy Guy, I know how much this community has added value and love and artistic talent, uh, as you see here in this gallery, here locally. So I want to present also a certificate in honor of the social, cultural, and economic contributions to the state of Arizona for the C community of Greater Peace. A great day in our community. Thank you much for being a part of it. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we are thrilled to have so many dignitaries from near and far with us for today's program, which will explore the interfaith message of your guru, Nanak, the founder and first guru of the Sikh faith. In honor of our exhibition, curated by our own Janet Baker, Guru Nanak, 550th birth anniversary of Sikhism's founder, now on view in the Kanuja family Sikh heritage gallery. I would also like to extend our profound gratitude to Dr. Carpenter, Kanuja, a trustee of the museum whose generosity created the Kanuja Family Sikh Heritage Gallery, one of only two dedicated Sikh art spaces in the country. Dr. Kanuja tirelessly works to enhance our understanding of Sikh culture, and in doing so, he truly helps the museum to bring the world to Phoenix and bring Phoenix to the world. Thank you, Dr. The Phoenix Art Museum is proud to host events like this in a time when greater connection across cultural lines is so important. We hope that today's event inspires you to seek more understanding, to welcome new ideas, and to see more. We hope that you'll make time to experience the exhibition on view, celebrating Guru Nanak's 550th birth anniversary, if not today, but in the near future. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. This is your museum, and we're happy that you are sharing it with us. Thank you. What is the value, if any, to the right to practice your religion freely if you don't even have enough money to feed your family? What is the value of this right if you are like the vast majority of America who are on the wrong side of our struggle with income inequality? What is the value of this right to practice your religion freely if you don't have affordable access to health care, a living wage, affordable housing, or a decent education for your children? I believe that if Guru Nanak were here with us in physical form today, he may assert that it's these secular challenges that must be addressed 
and are in fact preconditions to realizing the value of our right to practice our faith freely and really offer the opportunity to travel upon a spiritual journey. And really consistent with that approach, the historians have described Brunonic as someone who, prior to his well-known 3 day revelation, uh, where he connected with the divine, he essentially lived a secular life. He got married, he had two children, but imagine, uh, imagine that, uh, a holy prophet who had, had a wife and two kids, what we call today a classic nuclear, uh, nuclear family. Yet, he wasn't just that. Yes, Verdana was fully immersed, and he fully immersed himself in the regular world, worldly occupation um, and proved fully capable and willing to engage and participate in secular life, setting an example by which we all should certainly live. But he did so in the context of a very unique attachment of his inner soul to a greater spiritual force that occupied his mind both as a child and as a young adult. The message to me is that Gurudanik was saying, yes, sure, you know, we can do this, we can have a wife and two kids, uh, we can raise a family, have a job, earn a living, but it can't stop there. There is something more to which we must aspire. In achieving secular success in medicine, law, business, technology, uh, government, and so forth, I mean, it's, it's a great thing, uh, don't ever get me wrong. Um, but I would submit that we are not achieving our full potential as human beings in um, reaching those, those aspirations alone. There is something greater and far more fulfilling in our existence as human beings to which we must aspire. And what is that ambition? We are taught as six that it is a loving devotion and constant remembrance of our Creator to ultimately realize that the cycle of life and birth um, be liberated from and be one from the divine creator. So how does this translate to me standing here before you today as a local elected official? I personally view the challenge of elected officials and any public servants to strive for a more just society, to fight for equality in the areas of civil rights, religious freedom, environmental justice, and the type of societal change that brings us closer to becoming that more perfect union that we strive for as Americans. It's the, it's the emancipation of mankind from various forms of injustice that can, in my view, which I submit is born out of the philosophy of Gurdjieff, essentially to free up man or woman to focus on their spiritual journey and the relationship with the divine, no matter what their faith may be. And it's really a universal duty and a universal message that applies and is for the benefits of all faith communities and all humankind. The beginning lines that Gurdjieff wrote in what we call Jajisab, or, or known as Jajisab, is Ikhunkar, which means there's one creator. This concept of one, or oneness, is similar in some, in some respects to the famous saying uh, that is ingrained into the psyche of Americans, e pluribus unum. The Latin phrase that states, out of many, we are one. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we all, quote, we all came on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So it's really this, this juxtaposition between diversity on the one hand and oneness on the other that may seem discordant, uh, incongruous at first, but I would submit that it represents the genius and harmony that defines not only part of Gurdjieff's legacy, but also the values we hold dear as Americans as well. It is all of these concepts that I try to bring to bear as a Sikh and remain in the forefront in my, of my mind as a mayor of the city of Bobo. In closing, I want to touch upon another important concept um, to Sikhism that originated with Guru Nanak. It's the concept of love and humility. In fact, Guru Nanak called Sikhism a game. He 
called it a game of love. He said that if you want to be a true disciple of the Guru, if you want to be a true Sikh, you must, and if you want to play this game of love, that we know Sikh is in, then come to me with the palm, with, with your head on the palm of your hand. It's remarkable words, but they're very polite. Come to me with your head on the palm of your hand. By this, I believe that Guru Nanak is trying to tell us that love, not love of yourself, but love for the divine and also for all of his creations, meaning all of us, all of humanity, is essential to being a disciple of Guru Nanak. And you cannot do so without humility, specifically without trading in devotion to yourself to devotion for society. The symbolism of placing the head in the palm of your hand is emotional, it's powerful, and it represents the idea that humility and letting go of your own ego is essential to play this game of love that we know today is Sikhism. Omkar, you've heard Ravi Pala talk about it. So now to call Ikunkar one god is reducing it. And Ikunkar, this legacy, would be a fallacy if it, we said it was only for the six. So I want to take a few moments to explain what Ikyunkar really is. Is it oneness? There was oneness always before. Are we, we can say we are from the same fabric, but then some fabrics, some there's thread in the fabric, are we all equal? No. The oneness of Guru Nanak Sahib is very different. In this oneness, we are all a part of the one. There is no separation. There is no hierarchy in this one. We are one with everything and everyone. And this one is a part of us. You are an embodiment of divine light. We are an embodiment of divine light. The only question is, how do we access this divinity? How do we access this light? So this is the legacy of Guru Nanak Sahib. The legacy that you and I are a spark of divine light. That we are a gift from the divine. We are not a product of sin. Think about that. That is his legacy. And the Janam Saki tradition, which I will speak to you about, is actually a subset of the Ikyunkar legacy. So what is the Janam Sakis? What are they? They're narratives, they're life stories written by the people who were devoted to him and who best understood the legacy. So this legacy is from those writers. Who were those writers? We want to know who, who wrote them. And these were the writers who wrote them. But remember, they are writing from their perspective. So as a little boy, this tells us that he is being presented to his teacher at school. And this is a very formal painting. There are two planes in it. Remember, every religious painting has to have an unrealistic aspect to it because you're connecting uh, the ethereal world and you're collect, uh, you, know, you are also uh, putting together the worldly world. So you have two aspects of it there. And this is that. So the artist, has, the painter has chosen to tell us what we know is that his father, the teacher, and Guru Nanak belong to a special category, social category, economic category. Look below them, the children are scantily clad. We know that. Upper caste Hindu boys, when they get to the age of 10, this thread is put on them so that they are now able to read the scripture and they are now able to perform some ceremony and take part in it. So of course, Guru Nanak, the child, does his father's insistence that he must have the ceremony and the priest is called, the pandit is called and this is the commotion going on at home. And the child Nanak, the child Guru says, us, the, uh, the, the priest. Uh, and I want to quote here. He asked the priest, what protection is this thread going to give me? It will break. It will get soiled. 
if there is no protection for women, is there no protection for women? For, for the sudras, now the sudras are the lowest, so-called, so-called, not I don't say that, so-called lowest caste. The divine within will be my sacred thread. It will not break. Fire and storm shall not destroy it. Make compassion the cotton, contentment the thread, modesty the knot, and truth the twist. If you have that thread, put that thread on me. There is no thread of that. Of course, the pundit is furious. He goes up in a storm. But here, what is the Guru saying? He is actually shattering this whole idea that the privilege of connecting with the divine lies with the upper caste Hindu men. This is what he is doing here. So next we come to the three days in the river. And Janet tells me, you know, this was his enlightenment. And I pause here because the guru goes into, he bathes every day, he goes into the river uh, vein and he doesn't come out for three days. And then when he comes out, he has a profound experience. And then some call this enlightenment. And actually, that is quite problematic to say. That means that the guru did not have the spiritual wisdom or, or, uh, or the philosophical understanding before that time. When we know, quite contrary, the, that was not the case. So what we have said, the, uh, the academics say, well, this was the uh, time when he received a message. Tradition says, well, this was the time when he had an understanding and then he was given a mandate to go out and spread the world. So I want to talk to you, I want to share with you what the Guru says happened. So it is in the Granth, Guru Granth Sahib, and I want to quote that. So he says, I, the Bard, was jobless. The one gave me a job. I was given the divine command to sing ode day and night. The owner called me the Bard to the eternal abode, imparted me with the, eternal, with the eternal glory, imparted nourishment of the eternal immortal wisdom. I, as the bard, resound words of wisdom. I partake grace. These are his words as to what happened in the river. He was given a mandate. He was given this wisdom to then share with the world. And in that wisdom of sharing, he was constantly graced. So however you want to call those three days of enlightenment or his mandate to go out and spread the word, that is up to you. What is interesting in these two paintings, we have one on the left hand, uh, left on my left, which is Arpna Kaur. And Arpna Kaur is a very, uh, you know, a modern artist with great sensitivity. And she has chosen this scene, the rising, of him rising out of the water. And on the other side, we have the Singh twins, which are from the UK painting, which are heavily immersed in, um, in Christian art, depicting the scene. So they have the river, the symbolisms of the river. They have the lotus in the river as well. And then they have the ascension, basically, of the Guru rising. And then right on top, on the left-hand side, we have Guru in a, a, a yellow robe, being given a cup, the cup of nectar, the cup of Amrat from the divine. But if you look closely in the canopy, I don't know if you can see that, it is actually like the Palki. And there is an Ikyunkar there. Very subtly, it is in there. So we have this this mixture of the Christian art, the symbolisms of the Christian art, trying to incorporate some of the Sikh thought in this whole, in this painting. So Guru Nanak Sahib then brings, goes on his first journey and he begins the journey with going to the carpenter's house, Pailalo. 
and there's a feast going on in town and the ruler of the town has, and I'm making this very simplistic because I know we have an audience where are not, who are not familiar with the Janam Saki traditions, so I don't want to put words in there which would confuse the message because the message is very clear. So he's invited by the ruler to come and join the feast and Guru Nanak Sahib doesn't go to the feast. So the ruler is quite upset and says, why didn't you come to, a fe- to my feast, my extravagant feast, and you are at the home of this poor carpenter. And what does the Guru say? The Guru says, oh, so am I, yes. The Guru's answer was very simple. The food that you have prepared and served could not uh, be eaten because it is flowing with the blood of those you have exploited, while the food of the carpenter flows from honest living and is sweet like milk. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there is really no honor in the wealth which is earned through exploitation. So as we go along in our lives is that to see, and that's why this incredible thought of earning an honest living is coming from this principle. This is done by Devinder. He's an artist in India and he has tried to depict the blood and the, um, and the milk story. We now go to Mecca. Yes, the Guru traveled to Mecca and he goes, uh, as legend goes, he goes to Mecca and um, He's tired and he rests. And his feet point towards the Holy Kaaba. And the Kazi is very upset that how dare anyone point their feet to the Kaaba. And the Guru says, well, point my feet, you know, move my feet to whichever direction you think you want to. So he moves his feet and it seems, and as legend goes, everything moves with the Guru wherever it is. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the divine is every place. There is no place that is um, sacred. The first part is we have the Guru with Pai Mardana. And look at the side uh, where there are the fakirs, the devotees on the corner. Looks like there's a lot more of them. And below them, there's a dancing and a, a, a scene going on there. But back there's a mosque right there. So that is what is um, holding the scene together. So what is happening over here, which I want to share with you is, this is the, where, okay. In, in the top scene is, the guru is there with Paimardana, and he is with the people. And these people, they have nothing to wear. There's nothing. There is great empathy. Come below, there is merrymaking happening. These is the, they are celebrating at a dance party that is happening. And these are the Patans who have conquered India at the subcontinent at that moment. This is the Mughal Emperor Babur when he brings his army com- coming across. This is a Shabbat, uh, the writing which uh, Ravi Pala mentioned that the um, the army of sin has come in and they are making merry and the guru speaks to the divine where were you during this time so if you look at it the 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 rabab below and the rabab above one is bringing peace the other one is bringing merriment the one on top there's great peace and serenity there is great you know merriment going on there not caring the, social, the, the ones who are being empowered are enjoying life and the ones who have, they have persecuted are up there. This is also the time of Babur. This is when the genocidal campaign took place and no, no spiritualist spoke up about it except the Guru. And this is what the Guru says about, uh, about it, that the Muslim women... And he speaks about this genocidal campaign and he says, who are the ones who are suffering? What is the collateral damage? The collateral damage is the women. Always in war, the collateral damage is women. And he says, the Muslim women read the Quran and in their misery are calling out to Qadar 
their God, like, where are you in this? The Hindu women of high social status and other, others are also suffering and are also in this category. The wedding songs are being sung, which the wedding songs they are singing, but there is no, but the blood is flowing. There is no sandhur, which is, you know, the Hindu women put the sandhur in their head, the sign of marriage, that is not there. So he's calling out to the divine, keeping in mind when Guru Nanak was in prison, he was put in prison as well. So which spiritualist at that time spoke about what was happening in the country? But he did. So when we say that we stand for justice, when Ravi Pala says we stand for justice and all, it's because of this, because of the legacy. This is what we have been given. Everything what is in Sikh thought, what Guru Nanaks have practiced, has come into Sikh thought, has come into Sikh psyche, has come into Sikh practice. That is how these Janam Sakis make sense and we can connect with them. So as I come to the end of it, here there is the story that is being portrayed is of Pailena. Who is Pailena? So he is a worshipper of the Durga, of a, a different order, and he hears about the Guru, and he's on his way to the temple, and he decides to pay respects to the Guru. So he is there with his people, you know, with the flags, and he's going on a pilgrimage. But lo and behold, he decides to stop. He decides to stop and pay respects to the Guru. And what transpires is that he continues to stay with the Guru. And we know then what happens. The transformation takes place. With the arrival of Lena, of Pai Lena, Guru Nanak Sahib received the next carrier of light. And in the words of the Sikh theologian, Pai Gurdas, I say, he says, the sovereign coin was struck in the world. Guru Nanak Sahib started an impeccable commonwealth, a Pant. Then during Guru Nanak's lifetime, the canopy of the Guru's was seat was waved on the head of Lena, Guru Anga. Uniting light with light, the eternal Guru changed form. The light has transferred the form. The light is the same, the form has changed. This is the legacy of Guru Nanak Sahib. We were fortunate to meet Anjum, Javed, Dara, our next speaker, who is really a mystic at heart and is the curator at Lahore Fort and is the custodian of some of our heritage and was kind enough to show it to us. These swords are the bigger one daggers were used by the Afghan rulers who invade Punjab and India. That who belongs to Punjab and who ruled over Punjab. Otherwise, from last 2000 years, we have so many invaders from Central Asia, from Afghanistan, from Iran, uh, and from British was also a kind of an invaders. So Ranjit Singh consolidate the Punjab, and Punjab was a very vast at that time. It's it is not present Punjab. It was a very vast. There were four provinces: Multan, Lahore, Peshawar, and uh, Kashmir. These were the four provinces of under Ranjit Singh. So he consolidated the Punjab at that time, and he ruled for 40 years. Uh, and there are some conspiracy, and that was a very chaotic period at that time because of the Dogras uh, conspiracies with the uh, Sikh lords. So Maharaja Dilip Singh was just a five years old kid at that time. It was a very small kid. So Maharani Jinda, the mother of uh, Dilip Singh and the queen of uh, Ranjit Singh, she fought against the British in Lahore from, from Lahore Fort as well as the Shekhupura Fort. They all grown up, born and brought up in England, but they were never ever allowed to move into Punjab or India at that time. Here is a famous Sher Singh. This painting was also painted by Agat Shafi. This one, Maharaja is sitting under an umbrella where the Granthis, Pai Mansha is reciting the Guru Granth Sahib and other courtiers and high dignitaries are also sitting with him. So this painting was also painted by August Shafe. And recently, the, the government of Hungary uh, have a request that this, all these paintings which belongs to 
uh, August Schaffer because he was Hungarian. His father and his grandfather was also a painter. So he lives in a painter street in Hungary in Budapest. So the government of Hungary tried very much to, to, for the conservation of these paintings, but the government of Punjab never allowed because there must be some confusion and doubt that if these paintings will go to Hungary, they must back or not. So these are just in display at Lower Court. Here is one of the collections of Princess Bambal, here, the last Mughal emperor, Badr Shah Zafar. When in, in Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, Ranjit Singh was uh, at, sitting at the throne. In the center, Bahadur Shah Zafar was the emperor of India. So this painting was also painted by Agha Shafar. He was overthrown by British, you know, in 1858, he was overthrown by the British. And both of his sons were uh, beheaded by the British army. And he was sent to exile in Burma. And he is buried at Burma. And he died in 1862 after four years of his exile. These are four, two sons. The younger one, this. The younger one, Jawambak, Shazada Jawambak, and Mirza Mughal. Both of the sons were murdered by the British army. So look at this beautiful lady. You know who this is? She is the Princess Bamba, the grandson of Maharaja Dilip Singh. And this one lady is the British, is Annie Blanche. She was the uh, daughter-in-law of Maharaja Dilip Singh. She, she was the wife of uh, Victor Dilip Singh. So she died with uh, Victor Dilip Singh in 1901. There is an uh, elephant model, uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh is sitting uh, over the rider. It is a synthesis. It doesn't mean that uh, it's a combination, Sikhism is a combination. It's, the, it's a new idea. It's a new creation. It's a new revelation, which, uh, which is going to be established almost with the passage of time. Islam has also meaningful influence over Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and now its impact over Sikhism is also very clear in these days particularly. Uh, the beauty of Guru Granth Sahib uh, is the writings of various uh, writers from different communities. Uh, today the whole focus of the world is anti-racism and globalization. While Guru Granth Sahib delivered his message centuries ago, now it's a charter of Human Charter, United Nations Charter, which look after the anti-racism, globalization, the world is a global city, global village. Now that message was given by uh, Guru Sahban in almost four, 500 years before. Thank you very much.